Good evening, everybody, and it looks like we are live uh, to discuss uh, the state of European nationalism uh, one year after Brexit. Okay, let's see. Sorry, just forgot to get a uh, to get a mic nearby. All right, and I am joined by Colin Baker. If anybody's been uh, you know watching my channel and any of these live hangouts last summer, uh, Colin, a native of Scotland, uh, decided to uh, get he was able to get on with me, and we talked about Brexit and the potential consequences, where we saw things going with the UK, and we thought like, hey, maybe we can you know see where things are going. And I was talking to Colin last week, and we were talking about, hey, why don't we talk about now? that we've got a year later as far as a perspective and see how things have gone. Have things gone the way we expected? And maybe let's talk about European nationalism in general. And then uh, at the AP Euro reading a couple weeks ago, we both had the pleasure of seeing a lecture by Professor Lloyd Kramer. If anybody's taken AP Euro, uses the uh, Palmer, Colton, Kramer text. Uh, and also a recent book about nationalism in Europe and America. And Colin and I thought like, hey, let's just, you know, shot in the dark. What if we could get Professor Lloyd Kramer here with us to talk? That'd be great. And so we've got Professor Lloyd Kramer from the University of North Carolina, um, who is joining us uh, today to uh, this evening to talk about uh, European nationalism and the state of European nationalism one year after Brexit. So we're going to uh, kind of get into an analysis of that. Now, for those of you who are part of our AP Euro audience, uh, the new uh, course description that's been put out has very minimal changes um, to the curriculum, but one of those is national and European identity. So, you know, even though we've been teaching this kind of stuff already, uh, there is going to be a new emphasis on the test, which isn't any different, but thinking about, you know, what is it that makes Europeans identify with their nationality and, uh, you know, as Europeans. And let's go ahead and start with, uh, start with uh, you know, just a couple introductions. Colin, uh, is there anything I missed there where you're concerned? No, I think it's a really important theme to be adding. Of course, like you said, we're already teaching it, but to be stressing it throughout the course that the Europeans form local, um, regional, and then eventually national identities, and then eventually supranational, like international allegiances or identities. And you can be a member of one without excluding the others and you can have overlapping identities that's a really important concept in, in european history all right and uh and lloyd if you could tell us a little bit about uh about your work and specifically your interest in uh in nationalism in europe um and in america well i i became interested in nationalism because of its enormous political influence in modern uh conflicts modern revolutions but I've also long had an interest in why it develops such powerful emotional meaning in people's individual lives. So I think one of the, the values of the historical study of nationalism is that it gives us a way to think about the intersection of personal identities and large group identities. And it gives us a way to think about the different layers of motivation in modern public life. So. That's why I wrote that book about nationalism that you mentioned a while ago. And it's also why in my own teaching on European history, I always stress nationalism as one of the key forces in all aspects of modern uh, public and personal life. And what is it you mean by nationalism exactly? Because, you know, when we think of nationalism, I think the first things that come to mind are, you know, Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen, uh, Geert uh, Wilders in the Netherlands. Uh, there is a sort of, you know, kind of monolithic sort of thing that comes to mind. But then, uh, you know, your lecture a few weeks ago, you talked about teaching nationalisms uh, in an age of nationalism. So what is, what is it as, as far as how you define nationalism? versus how uh, just uh, people have come to define nationalism in popular culture right now? Well, I, I'm much more interested in the long historical evolution and emergence of nationalism. And I, I stress, like many other people, that the origins really go back at least to the late 18th century in the period of the American and French revolutions. 
And what really makes nationalism different from earlier conceptions of collective identity is the emphasis on the collective sovereignty of the people rather than the sovereignty of the king or the sovereignty of a small elite. And so what I would argue that it's not exactly Trumpist nationalism or Marine Le Pen nationalism. I would argue that all parties in modern debates about politics and public policy claim to be representing the true meaning of the nation. Everyone operates within this framing device of nationalism in the modern world. And now, as far as when we talk about that, you know, nationalism now, you know, Colin uh, being somebody from Scotland and also an immigrant to the United States, and as I understand, a naturalized citizen of the United States. Uh, Colin, how is it that nationalism affects you and just the way, you know, your identity uh, that's really kind of scattered about, uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, you know, backgrounds? Well, it's interesting that you don't really feel the power, the pool of power, emotional power of nationalism so much until you leave your country and you're the other. You are comparing yourself to the dominant culture that where you're a minority. And then you really start to think, what does it mean to be my nationality? What, what is, what's about my culture, my history, my accent, right? That's different. Um, so it's interesting that when you live in a place, often you don't feel the full effects of nationalism until you leave that place or till other people come in and challenge or at least um, make you aware that you're different in some way from them. So I didn't really see myself or, or um, I think too much about my national identity till I moved to the United States, actually. And then it became a, a thing. I was the Scottish guy, right? Um, so that's interesting in the context of Europe, where you've got so many s small nations living so close to each other. And how does that how does that work as far as, you know, last time we were talking about, you know, the about Brexit and especially Scotland's uh, future in the UK? Uh, you know, I've got a few maps uh, that we that we can look at here now, of course, uh, you know, last summer. Uh, the majority, you know, a narrow majority of people who voted in that referendum uh, supported Brexit, but we noticed that there was right. a lot of a lot of regionalism that really now England, which makes up about eighty five percent of the UK, as I understand yeah. it, uh, you know, was the you know the heaviest uh, supporter of Brexit. But then when we get into you know you had Wales uh, voted narrowly to support Brexit. Uh, but right. then you go to Scotland and there was not a single uh, constituency in Scotland that voted to leave that, uh, you know, the entire Scottish uh, region uh, voted right. to uh, voted to remain uh, in the, you know, in the EU. And of course, there was some uh, some fracturing uh, there and people were wondering, is Scotland going to try to leave the EU? Uh, you know, after that, of course, in the 2015 election, we see that the Scottish National Party, uh, you know, all but swept uh, Scotland right. there, which, uh, you know, as far as its official position is to, uh, you know, is to make Scotland an independent country. Uh, now, right. of course, we've seen some kind of uh, some strange changes here in the most recent election that happened earlier this month. Uh, yeah. So, so Colin, if uh, you know, I'll kind of hand the floor over to you here um, just to kind of look uh, look into what is it that's, uh, you know, we had the the anti Brexit vote. Uh, right. but then we see here that, uh, you know, the Conservative Party had a really good showing in Scotland this last time. So what does it mean to be to be Scottish, really? And how is that, uh, you know, how is that impacting things after Brexit? Well, Brexit has complicated everything in British politics over the last year. And it definitely affected the election of uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, the fact that all those gold SNP areas have turned blue, but not just blue, quite a few turned uh, red of the Labour Party gained some seats in Central Belt. Um, and the Liberal Dems gained a couple up in the north. So um, now, Colin, just to be clear, I'm guessing that this is not a very heavily populated area here. No, that's the part of the Highlands. So it's OK, and so this is where people actually live, where you see the SNP. 
Uh, right. And that's then, of course, you've got the labor and Lib Dem constituencies around here. Yeah, that's that little bit that you were just highlighting there on the top right. That's Aberdeen. In fact, near there is the seat of Alex Salmond, who used to be the leader of the Scottish National Party, and he lost his seat in Parliament. So that's a real indication that you've got these figureheads. I mean, he's he is what he used to be the top guy of the Scottish Nationalists, and now he's no longer a member of Parliament. And why was that? Because people who want to keep the union of the United Kingdom together used this last vote as a protest vote. It wasn't really a Brexit vote. It was a, they saw the national identity of themselves as being British. And the Scottish National Party was threatening that. So they got rid of one of their top guys and he was kicked out. Okay, so the power so of national changed, changed his, his, changed that seat. And uh, I think they dropped about 10 or 12%, in fact, across the whole nation, the Scottish Nationalists. Okay, so we see that the so as a as a Scotsman, uh, you know, and you you've got the European identity, the Scottish identity, but right. then there is this British identity uh, that seems right. to have. That's why. That's why I was saying earlier, it's really interesting in the framework, the new framework that you highlighted, that quite prominently throughout, it talks about overlapping identities. Um, I know Brian Vick wrote a book about this just recently in the Congress of Vienna, that, that you can be a Czech national but live in the Habsburg Empire and yet speak German, right? And, and these are three different nation, national identities, but they don't necessarily have to conflict with each other. They can, of course, affect each other. Um, and that's definitely what's happening today in Scottish politics and British politics. The independence referendum, should Scotland remain part of the UK? Should um, Britain remain part of Europe? And which political parties can deliver whatever your your nationalism wants? They're definitely all overlapping and affecting. It's a very complex series of calculations going on. When you go into the voting booth, it's not just, I'm left wing, I'm a socialist, I vote for Labour. I'm, I'm a, you know, landed aristocracy, I vote for the conservative. It's not like that anymore. It's far more shifting. Um, in fact, I, I learned in the BBC just the other day, this is hard to believe, first time I've ever heard this, that the working class vote shifted significantly to the conservative party in the election two weeks ago. And the upper class, the educated, if you had a, a degree, a graduate degree or higher, vote were more likely to actually be the Labour Party, the old left-wing party. So the whole kind of te tectonic plates of political alignment are changing in Britain, even as we speak. Okay. Now, uh, you know, as far as that, Lloyd, do you have anything from like a, an academic perspective, you know, going into, uh, you know, the this British identity with the Scots? And of course, then Colin was talking about how the educated vote was going over or the working class vote going over the conservatives doesn't sound so different than what just happened in the United States a bit in uh, in 2016. What, what do you have to say about some of these trends? Yeah. I mean, there's a sort of interesting parallel in France as well. I, I happen to just be in France in the aftermath of their latest presidential election. And some of the vote that would traditionally have gone to left-wing parties has been going to the National Front because workers, for whatever reason, feel threatened by either immigrants or they're unhappy with the way labor policies have evolved in France over recent years. And I think there's a kind of shift taking place in, in nationalism in general, where there are parties that claim to represent the economic interests of the working class by opposing globalization and international organizations. So that what were once the, the leftist parties may be gaining support from more globalizing or highly educated people who operate in that economy. And I think that's happening uh, in the United States, which is attracting uh, a different group of people in the Democratic Party. It's definitely happening in France. And I, I wanna emphasize a point Colin made. I think people recognize they can have multiple identities. That is, you can be French and believe that France's national interests are best served by being part of the European Union. 
And I think this accounts for the fact that Macron just won the, the presidential election in France. Those people also saw themselves as nationalists, but unlike the Le Pen group, they believed that French national interests would be better served by being part of the EU. So all of the boundaries seem to be shifting a bit. I, I think Colin's exactly right. Um, the old party labels don't fit, but I think nationalism is the thread that runs through all of the parties because whether they be of the left or the right, they claim that they are advocating either for the core values of the nation or the core interests of the nation or for the most advantageous position of the nation going forward. So nationalism is the glue that connects everybody. Okay, so there are people, and we were talking about this a little bit before the broadcast, that, you know, some some of the media outlets would say that this recent French election was a defeat of nationalism, but you would say that that's, that's not the case. This is one nationalism basically triumphing over another definition of nationalism. In fact, one of the core traditions of French nationalism is the conception of republicanism and human rights, which opposes the um, attack on immigrants or on people who are deemed to be un-French. So the, the real core of Macron's argument was, we are defending the traditions of the French Republic, which is a highly nationalistic position to take. And, and you may have noticed, for example, when he was coming out on the evening of his election, he symbolically stood in front of the Louvre, kind of the classic symbol of the French, really going all the way back to the monarchy, surrounded by French flags. Um, the, the idea that somehow the Macron group is anti-nationalist, I think would be a mistake because in fact, I think that's why they won. Their okay. version of nationalism trumped, if I may use that term, uh, the, um, the Le Pen version of French nationalism. Okay, now, yeah, because, I mean, his party is called something like On the March or something like right. that, which is very... On March, moving forward. Uh, moving forward. So very nationalistic, uh, you know, sounding in that sense. Now, just to kind of get your perspective as somebody who's just been in France and, of course, was in the United States, uh, you know, during the 2016 election, I guess what comes to mind is I remember the first night of the uh, of the DNC where they forgot to have flags out. You know, it was like, you know, it was like, oh, we forgot to have, you know, flags on the stage, which I guess they corrected later. Um, did Macron do a better job of articulating a nationalism than perhaps the Democratic Party did in the United when, States? When did the Democratic Party not have flags? I've never seen an event where they didn't have flags. Oh, OK. Yeah, They're there was something. The it, was the first, it was the first night of the Democratic Convention where oh, it was I kind of an oversight. Now, of course, after that, they came back with a with a vengeance and had plenty of flags. Um, but I didn't know if perhaps, you know, just observing those elections, if maybe, you know, Macron, there was something about Macron's messaging that really, you know, did that. I know in the Netherlands, uh, you know, Ruta, the prime minister, did a, you know, I mean, right before the election, he really flexed his muscle about uh, Turkey. And that incident kind of played into, you know, the right wing liberals were able to take that election, you know, whereas some of the polls were, you know, were giving that over to to, uh, you know, we're thinking that Builders was going to come out on top. Uh, so, you know, that was that's just kind of an observation, perhaps, or some, you know, it's I mean, I didn't really look at Macron's messaging. And of course, in our media outlets, it was like, you know, Europe versus mm -hmm. French, French identity or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think flags have become more important again in France in recent years. I, I mean, I don't know if Colin has the same view about Britain. But as compared to the U.S., it's, it's much less common ever to see flags in, in France on somebody's house or in, you know, nobody would put flags on their cars normally or something like that. Whereas if you see flags, it's usually on a government building. But I think starting about, I don't know, maybe five or eight years ago, or certainly even when Ségolène Royal was running a few years ago against Sarkozy, there was a sort of resurgence of the claim, we've got to claim the flag. Every, every party wants now to claim the flag. And this is where I would argue that, that nationalism is 
integral to everybody's definition of politics. You can't, you can't claim to be a viable political party without a strong nationalist message. Okay, gotcha. Now we might have uh, we might have missed. Uh, looks like Colin might we might have dropped Colin for a bit, but I guess he'll uh, hopefully he'll be back with us. Uh, now, as far as that goes, because I was actually talking with a British teacher um, who said something to that effect. As far as I was saying something about how you know public schools in the United States have a flag outside. They have a flag in every classroom. Now, of course, I was just in Texas uh, a few weeks ago, and their classrooms have two flags. I mean, they've got the American and the Texas flag in their classroom as a standard, uh, you know, which uh, we don't even do that in South Carolina. But uh, but the thing is, the British teacher was was telling me that that is not common. You're not going to see like the the Union Jack at the front of the classroom. Now, of course, okay. they've got their, you know, imperial pass that they may be a little bit uh, skittish about. I'm not sure. But that's that's something that, you know, you're saying is making a comeback in France. I wish I uh, wish Colin were here. He could sound off about, you know, about that in the UK. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that it's, there's a comparable kind of ritual in French classrooms. You know, we have the tradition in this country of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, and, and this is a very uh, ritualistic tradition that I don't think most countries have that extreme kind of ritual in, in, in the classroom. You know, it's sort of like you're I know when I was growing up, we had to pledge allegiance to the flag every day. Did you have to do that at school? Oh yes, we still we still do it at my at my school. I mean, I think most most schools still will yeah. do the pledge of allegiance. So, so this is an interesting phenomenon. Why I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands, but this is where I would argue that it also replicates certain religious traditions in that there are rituals of of worship or of honoring a higher power and pledging allegiance to the flag is uh, in that sense a powerful emotional experience for many people that carries that taps into a religious tradition okay and you were taught a few weeks ago during your lecture you were uh, you know discussing a scholar who was talking about nationalism as a religion and you were tracing some of this back to the French Revolution so mm -hmm. as the Western world is secularizing that nationalism in you know is is in some ways taking the place of a mm -hmm. civil religion or established religion yes I in that particular uh, evening at the AP, you're referring to the AP uh, reading, and we were talking about Carlton Hayes, who was an influential historian at Columbia University back in the 20s and 30s. And he argued that in the aftermath of the Enlightenment, as many Europeans lost their traditional religious faith, they came to view the state or the nation as a higher power that gave them meaning and gives meaning to their lives, also gives meaning to death and has to be honored in different rituals like holidays and symbols like flags and certain kinds of commemoration. So yes, I, I think that this is one way to understand nationalism, but again, it does not, this is where I would differ with Hayes, it doesn't displace religion in many places, it actually fuses with it. That is, people see themselves as both, um, say, French and Catholic, or American and, and Christian, or um, Israeli and Jewish, or whatever. It, it's not that they're in contradiction or displacement, they are uh, reinforcing. And I think that's one reason nationalism can have so much power uh, in the contemporary world. Okay, and you know, and I, I saw, you know, a couple years ago, that was the AP Euro DBQ was really addressing some of the French identity and, you know, some of the documents that the students were reading were really, you know, and in some ways, I think that's similar to the United States, that France is at once a secular country, but then in a lot of, you know, areas of France, also a Catholic country at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and also both French and American nationalism tends to be universalist in that they claim that the countries that they embody not only represent their own national identity and tradition, but that those traditions have universal historical significance. 
human rights, uh, individual uh, liberty, uh, sovereignty of the people, that the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, just like the Declaration of Independence, are not just national documents, they embody a universal principle. That's one reason those nationalisms have a lot in common. Okay, and I, and I was just, uh, you know, I just got your book in the mail a couple days ago, and I was uh, I was flipping through it, and I saw that, you know, because I was actually kind of curious about your talk, what you had to say about the American Civil War, and you you had some things to say about the Gettysburg Address, you know, and we're talking about, you know, the Civil War and all the things there, and I, I think that, you know, of course, uh, you know, people are arguing about, you know, slavery and all of those things coming in, and there's certainly a lot of documentation for that, but, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, it's like as far as taking Lincoln at his word that, you know, this is a war primarily to preserve the union, you know, and it's, you know, as far as the nationalism, that sort of spirit, whereas, you know, this Confederate position that, you know, these are states that can kind of like, you know, leave whenever they want. Of course, you know, there's some scholarship on Southern nationalism at that time, but, you know, Lincoln really in his first inaugural address is talking about the national constitution. This mm -hmm. is a, this is a, the United States is a nation and this principle is worth dying for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you were writing specifically about the Gettysburg address. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a bit and the impact of nationalism in the American civil war? Yeah, I, I would say there are two aspects that we could, there are really three aspects of the American civil war that I think connect very clearly with modern nationalism. One is the one you've already alluded to, which is we'll call it the unifying nationalism, the unity of the nation, which cannot be broken, and the strong desire to maintain and to create a united country. This corresponds almost exactly with what's going on with, in Germany in the 1860s and what's going on in Italy, the desire to have a powerful, unified national state. The second element of the, the Gettysburg Address that connects with nationalism is the claim of human rights, that people are created equal, that they have inherent rights, and this is one of the main claims of modern nationalism. And then the third element, which gives the Gettysburg Address such emotional power, is the honoring of the dead. And one of my themes in the book that you just described, and other historians have talked about this as well, is that when soldiers die, they take on a kind of Christ-like status that they gave their lives. And the highest honor that we as the living can give to those who have died is to honor and remember and, and continue in the spirit of sacrifice that they've made. So just as Christ gave his life so that human beings may be free and have life. Um, so the soldiers gave their lives so that the nation will have life. And this is where the Gettysburg Address links up with the oldest religious themes of honoring the dead who have given the ultimate sacrifice like Christ himself. So all three of those levels, you asked me, how does it, the Gettysburg Address connect with nationalism on all of those levels? And this is one reason it is one of the sacred texts in American nationalism. Okay. And, you know, that's interesting because I, you know, I looked at some of those things where, you know, some of the copy original transcriptions of the Gettysburg Address had under God and some didn't. And people will debate about that. But then, of course, when you look at Lincoln's first inaugural address and his second inaugural address, Lincoln's become much more, uh, you know, much more comfortable with invoking the divine. And so, you know, his nationalist, so would it, would it be valid to say that his, you know, his comfort with invoking religion, you know, of course, at the end of the Gettysburg, uh, the end of the Emancipation Proclamation, it was like, oh, legalese, 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 and then this is an act of justice ordained by Almighty God. Yeah, I, I don't remember, it, 
did he invoke God in the uh, in the Gettysburg Address? Is that the debate? Yeah, at the, at the end, he says, you know, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And of course, there are a couple, there are some variants of the original text that were published that didn't have that there. But, you know, certainly, uh, you know, that that is that's interesting to think about uh, with that. Now, now what, uh, you know, as far as as honoring the dead uh, now, of course, I guess all three of us technically uh, live in the South. Now, Lloyd, I know you're in the research triangle, so I don't know if that, back if that technically. Way. What's that, I Colin? Cut off. Oh, yeah, Colin's back. Okay, but yeah, Lloyd, you're in the research triangle, so, you know, but I guess technically you live in North Carolina. Um, yeah, we're there, definitely in North Carolina. We have North Carolina barbecue and not North Carolina music, and we live in North Carolina. That's right. Okay, okay, gotcha. Now, now, as far as, you know, I mean, there's been some recent controversy over, you know, Confederate memorials, especially in the city of New Orleans, and, you know, some of the, you know, regional nationalism, I think that's maybe yeah. not unlike uh, you know what Colin said about Scotland uh, earlier. Uh, you know, is there any of any of that significance as far as some of those memorials uh, honoring the dead and that sort of thing? I mean, did, did, I don't know. Maybe none of your research went into that Southern, you know, nationalism. Well, I I would say that the monuments of Southern nationalism are very much uh, like other kinds of national monuments. We have one on my own campus at the University of North Carolina. There was a monument put up in the early 20th century during the period in which the Lost Cause, as it was called, was having quite a, um, a surge of interest. And the monument faces north and it has a Confederate soldier protecting the campus in a sense. But above all, it is to memorialize and honor those soldiers who gave their lives for the life of the South. So I think those monuments are, are classic nationalist monuments. Would, wouldn't you agree that, that they generally are? And oh, yeah. I mean, me, see, and that's one thing that's, you know, for me being from the South and especially talking to people who aren't from the South, it's just, you know, it's it's been interesting because after, you know, that Charleston shooting in 2015, that was the first time that I ever heard of anybody speak ill of, you know, Robert E. Lee, for example, you know, because here's somebody that wasn't very ideologically you know, and that's one thing that I'd like to do on my channel at some point is to talk about specifically why is it that Robert E. Lee is honored so much, which, you know, here's the guy, you know, I'm almost hearing a little bit of Rousseau and some of this Lincoln stuff, you know, and Robert E. Lee, it's just, you know, it, my ideology doesn't matter. Virginia is my country, you know, and here's the guy that, you know, he's this tragic figure who, you know, gives his own career for the nation, so to speak, I guess, as he thinks about it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think Southern nationalism is an interesting example of how the memory of nationalism continues to shape identities. I, I don't know how much longer that nationalism of the South, you know, will have power. That's an interesting question. It seems to me that it's diminishing because mm -hmm. look, they are taking down monuments in places like New Orleans. Um, far more people in North Carolina, for example, uh, have very little emotional connection with the memory of the Civil War. So let's imagine 100 years from now or 200 years from now, will that memory still have strong emotional identity power? I mean, well, yeah, and that's we're, we're in a very speculative realm now. But as just as nationalisms can be created and are created all the time, it does seem that nationalisms can also diminish and and decline. Yes, and, and I think that, that will happen. I think that you're definitely, uh, you know right on that, at least as far as the, as the trend, uh, you know, just a personal story. Uh, when my, you know, I took my family to Washington, D.C., uh, you know, in the fall, and my daughter is seven years old, and I asked her, I said, Caroline, what do you want to go see when we get to Washington, D.C.? She said, I want to see the Lincoln Memorial. And of course, when I was seven years old in the 1980s, you know, that's the last thing I would have, you know, I mean, nobody had ever spoken of, you know, Abraham Lincoln as somebody who is 
you know, oh, I want to go see that memorial. I mean, I remember, you know, if I, you know, am, am absolutely honest, you know, it was, it's a little bit awkward, you know, if you're a native Southerner going in, I assume y'all have been into the Lincoln Memorial, but it's very imposing. You know, if you come from the South and that's your stock, it's like, basically this whole thing screams like, look, you know, you're, uh, you know, your ancestors lost and you need to deal with that. Uh, you know, there's this very like grand, there's this grandeur about it. Now, of course, my daughter, she was, you know, dancing on the steps and all of that. And I think that's great that, you know, she doesn't have that same kind of, you know, baggage. I think it's, you know, my grandfather's generation that really, really idolized uh, you know, the Confederacy and really kind of pass that to my father's generation. And to some extent, I think members of my generation, but, you know, my daughter, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's a lot, lot different in the world that she's, uh, that she's growing uh, up. This actually poses a question, how it might compare with Scottish nationalism, which well, seems was just to be dying out. Yeah, I was ahead. just going to ask that actually, Lloyd. I was going to ask you a question about baggage. Baggage can work both work both ways, and that certainly what I see in Scotland and and in a larger extent in Britain, particularly, and perhaps in France and the and the rest of Europe, the the generation that have has a memory or at least grew up shortly after the Second World War has a different view of nationalism than the. the kind of millennials today who that's that was in the distant past that was our you know we're very different from that there's world war ii it has a big effect on the union of britain on the creation of the eu of course uh on scottish nationalism um when i first came to the united states i was amazed to see the number of flags that were here on display right and it was very much in your face nationalism and I can remember growing up in the 80s in, in Britain that there weren't that many flags because flags and nationalism was, was a sign of, hey, we need to move past that. We did that in World War II and that look how that worked out, right? Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, Lloyd, whether you think as, the, as that generation kind of passes and people in Europe who, are, who are, don't have the baggage of nationalism, mm -hmm. whether they're more likely then to vote for the National Front in France or for the you know right-wing parties in Austria or the Netherlands. Do you see that, the, of course, the EU is created to, partly to keep peace between France and Germany, but now there's no collective memory of the costs of World War II. Do you think that will affect the future of the EU? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that it's true that the contemporary generation, the younger generation, doesn't have the experiential memory of the war and how devastating not just world war ii but world war one really had been for europe and i personally i think it would be a terrible tragedy if the eu were to fall apart uh simply because for all its problems it seems to be so far superior to what was existing in europe in 1914 or 1939 um so i i think that you know, when people have something like peace, they tend to take it for granted, you know? Oh, right. this is just the way it's going to be. Um, and so they don't realize the danger of extreme uh, nationalist identities or of nationalist uh, movements. I actually do not think, though, that we're going to go back to the kind of nationalism that was present in 1914 or 1939. I just think even though there's a loss of memory of those wars in some ways, I think young people just in general are more accustomed to thinking globally, moving around, being on internet and social media that carries them all over the world. I, I, I can't quite imagine we go back to 1914. Does, would you agree? And I, I would ask Tom the same question. I, I just suggested that I think nationalism in the South may gradually diminish in terms of Southern nationalism. But I don't think that we're going to, it's hard to imagine we're gonna go back to the point where people take national identity as superior to all other identities. It, okay. I'd, oh, I'd, I'd, yeah, I would say one, you've mentioned this before, um, Lloyd, earlier tonight, and then when you were talking in Kansas City in your excellent presentation, you, you mentioned though that, I would say that's true, for the people who benefit or 
uh, and to have adapted to and value the globalized world. But what if yeah. your economic situation is that you've not, that you've lost out because of That's this right. globalization? Then maybe there, what do you have to gain with this modern world, right? Maybe it's yeah. better to have a more narrow national identity. I think that's an excellent point, and I think that's that's why that we can see connection with what we were talking about earlier, where the traditional left and right parties are somewhat shifting, yeah. because the people who have not benefited uh, from this globalization tend to be working class industrial workers um, in most of the Western industrial countries. Right. And that's where there's a quite a bit of nationalism, quite a bit of uh, anxiety or resentment toward immigrants, and where the surge of nationalist support for far right parties is also um, has been developing. Now, yeah. now one thing, one thing, Lloyd, I want to kind of speak to something that Colin was uh, was alluding to. You know, I was reading how you know in France, uh, you know, the National Front was actually doing better with the younger voters than it was with the older voters. Now, of course, there's that baggage that the older voters remember uh, when it was uh, primarily a skinhead kind of party. Um, but is that, uh, you know, is that so, you know, it's like we would think that that younger generation, yeah, they're going to be more globally minded. But was that was that necessarily the, you know, the composition of the French electorate? I, I think that a fairly significant percentage of the National Front support was coming from the young. But I do not think that the, the great majority of the young were supporting the National Front. Do you see what I mean? That oh, okay, that, that, that makes sense. Okay, that, uh, that does make, uh, make some sense. So even though a larger percentage, uh, you know, not the, it's not how the majority of those young people think. And I guess we have to remember if it's anything like the US, most of the young people probably didn't even vote. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, to profile that group based on who vote, you know, how the people who voted, voted. And well, isn't this the pattern in Brexit as well, that the young people were much more resistant to, to Brexit? Uh, they voted remain at a higher level than older people. And I think in France, what was surprising was the National Front attracted a, fair, a, a fairly significant number of younger people. But they also, um, there were a lot of young people who were very resistant to the National Front. And I don't think the, ma the absolute majority of young people went for the National Front. But I, I, you know, I don't know the exact numbers. Do you know, Colin, how that broke down? In France? Yeah. No, I don't you know, know in Colin, the recent let's, elections uh, in France. Let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit. Uh, you know, we kind of lost you at some point where I was about to get back on to uh, Britain. Uh, you know, really um, interested, to, you know, to hear more of your thoughts on, you know, how Brexit has, uh, you know, really, how has this really changed or altered conceptions of nationalism? Uh, you know, also one thing that's interesting, of course, when we're teaching uh, European history or Western civilization, uh, you get into, uh, you know, of course, um, what is it? Uh, this guy, you know, I'm, I'm bad with German, Lloyd, but uh, Fichte, Fichte, uh, yeah. you know, what's... Johann Gottlieb Fichte, yeah. Fichte, Fichte, all right. I, I need this guy around for more of my videos. I know it's really fast, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. So, so, you know, Fichte, who was talking about how language is the most important yeah. uh, unifier. And right. so, it, so it's kind of interesting to see the Scots, you know, reject Brexit. But then, you know, when the Scottish National Party's like, hey, let's, uh, let's get out of uh, the UK and we'll, apply to join the EU and it looks like the Scots have uh, have rejected that so so what is it about this this British identity uh, that seems to have and and does this go back to you know World War II like when you think about okay everybody got together and got this done uh, what are your thoughts Colin well there's definitely an economic argument against um, Scottish independence at the moment. The referendum that they held three years ago, um, the SNP made all these promises that recently have been the Scottish economies and uh, the oil prices particularly 
and the oil revenues have dropped. Um, so is it economically viable for a small, I mean, look at Iceland, right? Is, is, do we want to be another Iceland, right? Uh, after, especially after a great recession, is it a wise thing? So that, that's why Scotland needs, it sees itself, if we're gonna leave Britain, it needs to rejoin the EU, it needs to be part of a bigger collective group. So that's where definitely the overlap, your identity is Scottish, but you still, you, the economics are such that you want to be part of this larger group. So in a sense, Scottish nationalism, kind of like Lloyd was saying with Macron, is not opposed to the European Union at all. It just sees itself as being, a, a, we can be a viable independent state, right? And a small nation. Um, but with the last election, there was a large number of people who said, wait a minute, if we vote in a large Tory majority, then we're going to have a hard Brexit. Britain's going to leave the EU and all of its four, you know, four freedoms. And it's going to be a complete break. And then where is that going to leave uh, the British economy? Right, or the Scottish economy. So there's definitely uh, that had an effect on the Scottish national vote in, in the last election because people realized we don't want a hard Brexit. When, when people voted for Brexit, what they, what they really voted for was let's control immigration, right? They, they didn't vote for let's uh, have the national economy collapse. That's not what they're voting for, right? Unfortunately, the EU has four, these four freedoms are goods, services, capital and people right and you the eu is very clear just they just started the the uh in brussels theresa may was there yesterday i believe and so the negotiations are starting the eu is telling britain you can't cherry pick between these four things you can't have everything and but not migration and um, so the, the four freedoms are either all going to stay or they're all going to go right and if they all go and you have a hard brexit where does that leave the British economy? So there's been a very, it, even today it was very interesting. Um, the chairman of the council of ministers, his name is Donald Tusk. He was talking about potentially at the end of all these negotiations, there's still of course going to be a vote in Westminster in the house of parliament. And he was even dangling the carrot that perhaps Britain at the end of the day might not even want to leave the EU and it might be reversed at the very last minute Brexit. So I think the current election has thrown the dice up in the air again. And will Brexit happen? Most likely, will it definitely happen? Who can say in two years? Yeah, now uh, now one thing, Colin, uh, you know, I would be interested, and I thought maybe we would be talking about this a year later, but the negotiations really haven't made any progress. Now, I think that, Just you know, and I'll go, I'll go on record saying this, I think that somebody's going to break on some of those four freedoms that you speak of, but it'll be interesting to see, is the EU going to hold that line or is, you know, there going to be some kind of 11th hour thing, you know, especially, you know, given the role of the United States, you know, in offering, who knows, who knows. Now, Colin, there's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to look for some questions here. Um, there, Sam M wanted to say though, before we get to questions, the city of London has a higher population than Scotland. Let that sink in. Uh, I guess that was directed at you, Colin. I'm not sure, but uh, but that's yeah. Uh, and, it, and I like London. I've lived I've lived there for a while. And and at the Remain votes, that there were two parts of Britain that voted to remain. It was Scotland and London. It's interesting because the Scottish nationalists are always saying those people in London we don't understand them. They're totally different from us. And yet, when it came to Brexit, Scotland and London were completely in unison. It was the rest of the country that were voted to leave. Okay. Okay. So let me, uh, let me see here now. Uh, now one thing, um, Jay Haler, now we've got an interesting, uh, interesting bunch. I think people saw nationalism and, uh, we've got a few, uh, few hard right wingers, uh, here in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, but, uh, but as far as, uh, as far as that goes, this one, uh, Jay Haler seven, uh, why do the Scots want into the Scottish national party, um, why do, why does the SNP want independence from Westminster and their austerity pushing agenda yet they are fine with the EU which pushes austerity look at Greece hashtag hypocrisy <laughs> well that's a great question and the thing about Scottish nationalists of course is that they're left-wing nationalists kind of different from 
the Marine Le Pen or Gert Wilders. So Scottish nationalists like they have an affinity to U the European Union because they like the social programs. They like um, workers' protection and all sorts of environmental bills and laws and European Court of Justice. And that, these would be things that in France they wouldn't like, but in Scotland the Scottish nationalists do like. So they don't see the European Union as being a negative thing in that respect. European Union pushes all these things and the Scottish nationalists like those. So... Okay. Now, another thing, uh, you know, you had mentioned, uh, you know, in the Netherlands and uh, Wilders, stuff like that. Uh, you know, Lloyd, I kind of wanted to get your uh, take, too, because, you know, with some of these shifting things, you know, one thing is somebody who's, uh, I'm, I'm interested in all things Dutch and Dutch politics. One thing that I thought was interesting about Wilders, uh, while, you know, th there is, of course, liberalism is such a moving target, but, you know, although a lot of times, you know, Wilders is right wing, you know, hit part of his thing is pushing uh, you know, gay rights and basically Islam and immigration as a threat to the liberal consensus in Dutch culture. You know, that it's like we bring in these immigrants and they have a problem with our liberal and accommodated and accepting society. Uh, you know, and then when I saw Donald Trump specifically, now, of course, this isn't to give a verdict, uh, you know, from the LGBT community, you know, people be divided on that. But certainly uh, at the RNC, uh, you know, when Donald Trump in his acceptance speech, you know, before he got up, he got a gay entrepreneur to speak in front of him. Uh, you know, he specifically mentioned the LGBT community, uh, which was very interesting in a republic. You know, it's just, you know, got applause from that Republican delegation. Uh, you know, to what extent has Donald Trump, you know, in his campaign, did he kind of hijack this sort of like, kind of hodgepodge, like almost liberal-esque nationalism that really was foreign to the United States in a lot of ways before he was running. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Lloyd? You mean, did Trump uh, adopt conceptions of nationalism that are more characteristic of Europe than of the United States? Correct. And that's something that you went into in your talk that I found very interesting that this brand of nationalism that Trump brought, oh, you know, it's like almost like he brought elements of that over from Europe, that it was in some ways more European than American in its presentation. Well, I think American nationalism has always had two very powerful strands. One is uh, we might call it ethnic and religious, and in that strand, it's pretty similar to a lot of European nationalisms. It stresses, um, it, traditionally, it's, tr it's stressed like the Anglo-Saxon tradition or Protestantism or uh, the English language, things like that. But the other strand of American nationalism always said America is a nation of immigrants. It is not just one nationality or ethnicity. It is held together by a creed or an idea. And I think that one of the ways in which Trump, although he argued for American exceptionalism, he actually advocated in many ways a more... Um, a more ethnic or at least a more uh, cultural definition of America than the multicultural definition of America. And the most distinctive form of American nationalism, I believe, is multicultural nationalism. This is what made American nationalism different from many traditional ethnic, linguistic, and religious nationalisms in Europe. So what I was trying to argue earlier was that although Trump argues for American exceptionalism, many of his views are more similar to traditional kinds of European ethnic and cultural nationalism. Okay, and you know, this is kind of kind of interesting to me as being someone from the South, you know, and, I, and I've had some interesting conversations now, you know, I'm going to New York City this weekend and I asked a teacher, I said, oh, I'm thinking about doing a meetup, uh, you know, do you think some kids might be interested? You know, I've been wanting to eat at, you know, Morgan's Barbecue in Brooklyn. And she said, well, actually, some of my students are fasting for Ramadan. Others wouldn't eat at the barbecue place because of pork. 
uh, you know, some of them will be, will have Shabbos on Saturday. And I was like, whoa, you know, I've never really thought, you know, being from South Carolina, you know, not even, you know, not even in yeah. a, you know, research triangle, you know, that was like, wow, like just to be, you know, even for me to encounter, you know, I, I did a review session in Miami before the exam. And it's like, wow, this, there are parts of this country that are so much more diverse than what I'm used to. You know, for example, if you pull up the, you know, the election map, you know, you think about some of these, you know, these red states, uh, you know, is there, and of course that's a big theme in U.S. history is sectionalism. Uh, you know, are these red states for the most part, you know, you look at like West Virginia where Trump won every county, uh, you know, is there a sectional element for these, you know, competing nationalisms you speak of? Because, you know, I just find that interesting being from the South, where, of course, when, you know, you look at the census data, you know, people are asked about their ancestry and in predominantly white counties in the South, the biggest response is American, you know, whereas if you go to Maine, it would be English or something. Uh, you know, what what kind, I mean, do you see a sectional element in these, in some of these things? And as far as how that was, you know, used in this election? Well, I, I think that there's a pretty clear pattern and it goes way back um, that the areas of the country that had the largest percentage of immigrant populations going back to the 19th century, um, these states tended to vote differently from those states that had the smallest percentage of immigrant populations. My, my own state of North Carolina for a long time had one of the very smallest percentages of people living there who were born outside the state. At, at one point, it was some incredibly small percentage, like, you know, five or 10 percent. I think that as states develop larger number of immigrants um, or a more diverse populations in terms of religion and culture and ethnicity, language, um, they tend to vote somewhat differently. And I think if you go back to that map, it would be interesting to know how much diversity um, influences people in each of those states. You know, that there's, there's another theory that when people become aware of more diversity, they actually tend to uh, vote on those grounds more readily. That it, I, I don't know quite what the threshold point is, you know, but like people may be more concerned about ethnic diversity in Ohio than they are in New York State simply because it's more unfamiliar at this point. Yeah, and, and see, I That's think- That's a great point. Can, if I could jump in for a second, the Brexit yeah, yeah. Was, was exactly about that, Lloyd. Um, the London, of course, globalized city, um, votes for Remain, but areas of uh, Northeast England that have um, kind of traditionally, uh, you know, whiter, uh, more con um, more working class, less immigrants, they're generally voting for leave, except uh, when, so what, well, what made it interesting was that if you had a large a group of immigrants arriving recently, yeah, so it, so if you have a recent large influx that threaten your traditional culture, then those parts of Britain saw that as a challenge and a, and a, and a threat, and they voted to leave. But the, so but we the, see like this like area London, here, Colin, would that be one of those areas you're talking about? Yeah, up up in the north, right? It's exactly like these kind of post-industrial cities um, where the economy is not doing well, and they don't have a large immigrant history or tradition and then suddenly lots of Eastern Europeans arrive um, or people from South Asia arrive right and they see them as a threat to their economic stability and position so in that case the, the more the immigrants arrive like you're saying Lloyd there's some threshold if, if, if they've been there for a while and it's been integrated then those parts of Britain they're as accepted and these these areas voted to remain but the ones who just arrived, like the first generation uh, and in, in a city, they voted to leave. It can actually be a very small percentage of people who create a large anxiety. Um, you know, it may only be two or three or five percent, but because it's new and unfamiliar, I think this is what you're saying, it's more disconcerting yeah. 
than right. if it's a society with 40 or 50 percent. Right. Exactly. Now, now, uh, Colin, we were talking about last year, you know, when you look at Scotland, for example, like we were talking about how Scotland gets a lot of benefits of the trade, but really doesn't have to deal with some of the things that you see in England. Like, I believe that Scotland's still about 85 percent white British. Uh, you know, what what is I mean, as far as Scotland being a less diverse region, how how does that affect their vote uh, in, you know, as far as the way that they view some of these things? I think that's part of it. It's, it's more to do with the traditional, uh, where's the economic base of Scotland? It's been in shipbuilding and fishing and, and finance. And if you look at all those things, actually, those aren't really a land based. It's not it's not an agricultural based. There are things where you travel overseas, you meet foreigners, there's foreign businesses coming in. And Scotland's always, even going back to the 1700s and before, Scotland's always had like a, a, a wide network of, of economic connections, right? So there's always been new ideas and new people coming in and out of Scotland. Whereas if you lived and you were a peasant farmer in the middle of England and you never moved from your home, you know, eight miles, they're little Englanders, right? I think there's a difference there. You're right. There's less foreigners in Scotland. There's less. There's more percent of, 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 of you know traditional white Anglo-Saxon and Protestants and Catholics, but there's a so that might have an element to, to do with it. it's not overrun by complete outsiders perhaps. But I think it's more to do with Scots are just more globalized in their thinking traditionally and historically than the English people. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and we were talking about, you know, it'd go back to the United States, Ohio. There was an article that was that I read before the election. It was asking, is Ohio still a bellwether state? Because Ohio, as the nation has become more diverse, like Ohio with the ins and outs, like the state has actually become less um, ethnically diverse in relation to most of the uh, most of the country. Uh, so that's that's very interesting. Of course, me coming from the South, you know, is, uh, you know, is, has been very interesting. So, yeah, we got to discuss, uh, you know, regionalism, which that's just interesting as a Southerner talking to a Scotsman, uh, you know, is uh, so many parallels here. Uh, you know, any uh, any closing remarks uh, before we, you know, as we uh, as we wrap it up? I, I would just well, I would say. I would just say as a general point for historical studies to bring it back to our starting point, um, although nationalism never stays the same and it keeps evolving and it may have less effect in some ways than it did in 1914 or 1939, I don't think there's any way to understand what's going on in the world today without a very careful analysis of the history of nationalism as both a uh, cultural and a political phenomenon. So I want to make a strong case for the continuing study of, of nationalist ideas, nationalist traditions, and nationalist ideology. And great. And, and Lloyd was saying, you know, I guess when this when this book came out, nationalism seemed to be kind of on the uh, on the wane. And they were like, what, you know, and he's really kind of setting a trend. So, yeah, I mean, nationalism, it, it'll change, not going anywhere. Uh, definitely something through which whether we're teaching European history or U.S. history, uh, right. this should be something that is, you know, a constant part of uh, of what we're teaching. Uh, so definitely thanks to uh, Professor Lloyd Kramer for joining us. You know, Colin and I just shot in the dark. And, you know, if you use that textbook, just remember y'all have seen the guy. And, of course, there's uh, there's this book as well. Uh, Colin, any uh, any closing remarks? No, I was going to agree with Lloyd. Particularly the case in, in Europe. The European Union is, of course, a supranational body. And yet its future is uncertain now. It, and it's really a bellwether, right? Are Europeans going to pool closer together? Maybe Britain will leave, but the rest of Europe will hang together and there'll be this multicultural nationalism. Or will Britain leaving be a, a sign that actually these supranational bodies like the EU doesn't have a future and we're going back to an earlier form of nationalism, perhaps? I don't, I don't know. I hope that doesn't happen. But it's, it's worth watching Brexit particularly but to see how they, not just how Britain acts and what happens in Britain, but how the other 26 countries, how they treat Britain and how they see themselves as part, it might reaffirm their beliefs that actually we like having an EU. It's a strong thing and it might actually invigorate the EU to think for the future. So that's definitely worth watching what happens in the next couple of years there. 
Yeah, and, and Colin, can you show us real quick those flags you've got behind you? Uh, you know, last time you were uh, you were with us. Overlapping national identity: Scottish, British, EU. This is on our Scottish flag, so okay. might be losing this for two years, but that's not my choice. Okay, not your choice. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Colin and uh, Professor Lloyd Kramer, and maybe we'll be back again in a year, kind of reassessing uh, where everything is. But uh, thank you all very much for joining me and to the audience members who joined us during the summer. I know nobody's thinking about this stuff, but tomorrow is actually, if you're in Britain, it is the anniversary of Brexit. So happy Brexiversary or whatever they call it, if you're into <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you again for my guest. And I will be back soon with uh, with some other videos on U.S. and European history. It's always Thank you, fun. Tom. Thank you for inviting us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.